So good to see you tonight in the house of the Lord as we continue passing through our Wednesday night series on Israel and understanding the end times. And so the more we understand about Israel, the more we understand the key to everything that's going to be happening in this end time prophecy. So we'd like about two more sessions, and then we'll be kicking into uh, Jesus, prophecy, New Testament, all of the things. But we've got to get through two main parts that kind of lead us to it. Tonight, we will be dealing with this remnant dynasty of Israel. Uh, And we will be dealing with a few of the books, what we call the poetic books, that lead us into, because as Israel is crumbling as a nation... Uh, Israel has, as we discussed before, one side of the northern tribe had already fallen apart. Uh, the Judah, all of this, is finally taken in. We, we, we studied the Babylonian captivity as far as understanding that. And now we're reaching a point to where Israel will never have another king. Israel will never have another king, even though God has said that Jesus is coming one day to be king. And so you start to realize why in Jesus' time they were waiting for their king. They're waiting for their Messiah. They're, they're, they're just a remnant people who are holding on with everything they have to, to be able to, to reach this, this crescendo that, that God is going to send. And so tonight we're going to read and go through some of the books that describe this uh, setting up for this. So you've got your papers, and, and as we kind of walk through this, we'll, we'll break this down and understand it. So understand first that the books of Job, the book of Psalm, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, these are all poems. This is poetry. So where a lot of people get into problems is they, they look at these books and they want to come up with theology. When, when you listen to a song, and when I was growing up by Bob Seger, okay, I, I may like the song, but I don't need to build my theology off of it. It has, it has some good points in it. There may be a line or two that you're like, that's good. That's really good. But, but you, don't, you, don't, you, know, you don't do that. And so where a lot of times people get into problems is you'll hear people take Psalm 91 or, or, or some psalm, and they'll, I'm going to pray the blessing of Psalm, you know, this psalm. Understand this is poetry. You read it, and depending on where you are in life, you interpret it a different way. Anybody ever done that, reading the psalms and reading? So, so you have to understand that poetry is not meant for theology. And I know I'm going to get in trouble for all that, but it's not. It wasn't designed, the book of Job was not designed for you to come up with your theology about life. It was meant to be read, enjoyed, and pull from it what God would speak from it about your life at the moment. So when I read the Psalms, if you go every day and read the Psalms, as people will will advise you, hey, read a Psalm every day. That's good. Why? Because wherever you're at in your life, it will will speak poetry into your life. It will speak into your life. If I read the book of Job, it's going to speak into my life. But it's not like Ephesians or Philippians where we are to, to extract doctrine or be good. So, so put that down, that poetry, and, and here's the unique thing about God. If, if people always wonder about, is there a God, is it there a God? Well, think about it this way. Think of all the languages that you've heard. And think about if you had to translate those languages into English or into another language. If it's poetry and you had to transpose the rhythm of one na- nationality into German. Would that be hard? Yes. Here's the unique thing about Hebrew. Hebrew's poetry is not written in rhythm. It's written in parallel. It's written from the context, it's poetry written in parallel. So sometimes you will read 
that it'll say something and it'll come with the next line and explain that something. Does that make sense? It, it'll, it'll say one thing and then it'll come back and answer it on the next one. Say one thing, come back and answer it. It's not rhythmic. It's not, doesn't have to rhyme. That would be very hard if we had to take the Hebrew language and try to make it rhyme in English. So God in his unique wisdom, when he created and designed the Hebrew language and gave them the poetry of Psalms. That's why has anybody ever heard somebody sing Psalms, like hear them sing a Psalm? That's the ugliest music you'll ever hear in your life. Because, because singing it is not the point. It's not built like, like our music, like rhythm. It's, it's telling a story. It's telling a story. It's telling a story. And so it's easy to translate into German, to English, to whatever language you would want. Because you don't have to rhyme the words. You just need to come up with the exact meaning of the word. So that as you're reading it, it translates into the same thing. Is that neat? I know it don't, probably don't mean anything to y'all. Y'all like, y'all like, I'm still trying to digest spaghetti, brother Lot. I cannot think right now. So, but for some of us, it's like, that is so cool that God would take the time to say, I'm going to create a language that uh, 2,000 years from now, they'll be able to translate it and make it make the same sense that it would make then. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. So the first of this is the book of what we call Job. Uh, Job is the oldest book that we have. It's the oldest rhythmic or the oldest patriotic uh, book. In fact, he would have lived somewhere. It would have been described in the Abraham time, in the time of Abraham. Somewhere in the patriarch time is when the book of Job would have been suggested that it's, that it's now maybe even a little bit before Abraham. But what it's trying to do, it's trying to tell you the life of a patriarch. So if I'm trying to tell a story of, of Huckleberry Finn, what am I trying to tell the story of? Life when? On the Mississippi River in, in, in the late... 1800s, 1900, when you would just tie rafts together and float down the Mississippi, and, and you can imagine that stuff. Well, imagine people living in their time, and you're wanting to think about Abraham and how they lived and, and how they... So you have this man who is, who is serving a God he doesn't understand in the way that they would now, but they read this and they say, now that's true faith, because that's a patriarch. That's someone who was believing in a God he's never seen, believing in a God he, he's never really even, quote, heard from, like, we, like we've seen Mount Sinai, and we've got all our stories. He is just simply, in fact, he is so devoted to this God that he sacrifices for his children. He, he, he does all of these things, and, and he trusts in this God. And so he's trying to show you this just root elemental trust and faith, like Abraham would have had, Job had. And they're trying to tell it in a story form. So go with me and let's look at the main scripture, Job 28 and 28. Listen to what it says. And to man he said, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is... That sounds like it comes out of Proverbs, doesn't it? Because what it's trying to do is it's trying to narrow down the meaning of this story. Now, we, we take it in theology. You know, we, we try to put theology, well, you haven't suffered like Job. You could, you could say, well, you hadn't floated down the Mississippi River like Huck Finn. And what we try to do is extract more. But what it is, is when if you tell someone, you need to read Job. What am I going to get from Job? Here's what you're going to get. Behold. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Being in awe of God and fearing God and trusting God in the middle of whatever life brings. That is the greatest thing that you can accomplish in your life. And to depart from evil is understanding. So to not pursue it, to not grab hold of it, knowing that it will, it will ruin your life means that you understand what this book is about. 
If I understand Job, I understand two specific things. I understand that the fear of the Lord is everything. And I understand to stay away from evil because evil will trip me up along my life. That's what it's telling you. Let me give you three main points of the main question of Job. So if, if, if you said, who would I suggest to read this book? If you're talking to someone and all they keep asking you is, why? Anybody ever get in a conversation? Well, I don't know why this happened to me. I don't know, know why that happened. I don't know why my life turned out like this. I don't know why I got sick. I don't know why. Go read Job. Go read the poem of Job. You're a perfect candidate for Job. Now think of Israel. God has given them this book to read while they're in Babylon, while they are going through all their turmoil. This is a book that they would have had, and it would have been a book. So you can imagine people's like, remember Job. Remember Job. So here's the three things about Job that answers the why. Number one, trust me. Trust me. That's what God's going to ask you from Job. He's going to say, I know you don't understand it. I know you don't see it. I know it's confusing. But here's what I need. I need you to trust me. Number two, what God is saying through the book of Job is simply this. Don't condemn me. Because the hardest thing is, when you start asking the why question, is you want to fill in the blanks, right? Right? Or well, maybe God just doesn't want to, you know, I don't know why God's cursed me. Who said you was cursed? Who, oh, where did the curse come from? Why are you adding things? Why are you condemning God? Why are you adding things? You're just going through a problem. Don't add to it. Don't try to make more of it than it is. Don't condemn God. Don't go and prejudge God and determine what you think God is thinking because you don't know. Throughout my life, if I had been condemning God and wondering why God was putting me through all of that stuff, and I would never have understood this. And some of you in this room, you, you can look at your life and think, I wouldn't understand this unless I had been through. And, and what kept me was not doing the little bad things or the, or the destructive things that would have messed up God's plan. So when I ask the why question, which is normal, God says, you got to trust me. Number two, don't condemn me. And number three, grow through your pain. Grow through your pain. Notice I didn't say we're going to pray, take all your pain away. There are times when God heals and God does miracles. But 90% of the time in your life, it is the pain itself that you've got to go through to grow through it. And, and, and that's just the way God grows people. The story ends with Job twice as rich. Twice as, why? Because he doesn't distrust God. He says, even though I don't understand, I've reached everywhere, yet with these eyes I will see him. He will answer me one day. He, he didn't condemn God. He, when people said, you must have done something wrong, he said, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I, I don't know what God is up to. And he kept growing through the pain. Just curse God and die, Job. You talk like somebody foolish. I have trusted God when he was good to me. Do you think now I won't trust him while he's bringing me some trouble? I'm going to trust him in the pain. I'm going to trust him in the discomfort. I'm going to trust. That's what the poem, the story of Job speaks. And this is important because what it's trying to do is it's trying to set them up for what's coming. The second book that we come across is the book of Psalms, which is just sing it out. Psalm is simply this, define a psalm. Let me give it to you. Defining a psalm, it's just a poem or a song with a musical instrument and it's to be used to praise and worship the Lord. That's a psalm, a psalm of praise. It is, it is simply a poem or a song using a musical instrument, and is to be used to praise and worship the Lord. Now, go with me in, in your Bibles to Psalm 137. 
verses 3 and 4. This is the main psalm. And I try to pull one from each one of these just to give you the main thought of all of them. If I had time, I would tell you that many historians believe that Psalms is broken down into five different books, five sections, and each section describes the first five books of the Bible. So as you're reading Psalms, what you will come across is the first few Psalms speaks about man. Genesis. Exodus, you'll find a lot of Psalms in that section that speak about escape. God is my escape. I will, he will provide me escape. He's talking about Exodus. And in Deuteronomy, Numbers, all of that, as you go through the first five books, you will find that it talks about earth. It talks about all of these different things. And finally, in the final one, the word. The last Psalms is all about the word. So he goes through the first five. Now, I'm not telling you that's exact. I'm just telling you that, that people who study it will tell you it is very precise how it is built in this way. So here's what Psalms 137, 3 and 4 says. For there, for there those who carried us away captive asked us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? What this was, was Babylon was taking them away. And you got to understand that Psalms was written over a 500-year period. Psalms was not written just by David. There were over five or seven authors that, that, that wrote Psalms, many, many authors. And it lasted almost 500, not, it lasted to post-exile. Some of the Psalms are all the way to the end of the exile nearly. But this Psalm is written right in the middle of all of this, and it's them carrying their instruments. They're the musical people. They've been captured by Babylon. And Babylon requested, bring us any skilled people, bring anybody that has uh, understanding. We know Daniel will later be carried because of his wisdom. And, and he's a young boy who's very bright and everything. So they're going to get him. But if you had a musical talent, they would be. And so while they're traveling on the caravan back to Babylon, they stop and they tell them, they say, eh, play us a song. Oh, don't play one of them sad songs. Play, play one of them happy songs of Zion. And they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And that's what Psalms is about, singing the Lord's songs in a strange land. We walk and live in a strange land, but yet we're singing the songs of praise. He turns my... Ashes and beauty and all the other stuff that y'all sing and it comes out of Psalms. It's all, I'm not a singer, so I don't do all that stuff. But they pick them Psalms apart. Ooh, that's a good phrase right there. We're going to make a song. And that's all cool. It's all good. But understand the main thrust of it is singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Let me show it to you this way, give you six things real quick that you'll pull from Psalms as you read, just like Job. When you read Psalms, you're going to pull some things, and here's what they are. Number one, thanking, thankfulness. You will hear a lot about being thankful, thanking God. Number two, His Word, trusting in His Word, depending on His Word. Number three, you will talk about He will give me strength. It's it amazing, like when you hear praise songs today, it's, it's, it's a lot of the same stuff. It's about giving thanks, or your word, or you make me strong. Number four, just praising. You're worthy of my praise. The fifth thing you'll find is that trusting, trusting in the Lord. Leaning on the Lord. Number six talks about God's mercy. The mercy of God. It's never ending. It doesn't run out. And that's what Psalms is meaning to tell you. And as for Israel, you've got to understand, they are fixing to go through a period. When I finish this tonight, and we talk about the remnant, they will spend the next 400 plus years with no word from God. 
And these are the books and these are the things that they read and these are the things that they lean to. These are the things that they turn to. These are the things they sing to each other. These are the things they speak to each other to hold on for this Messiah that's coming. If I told you I'm fixing to lock you up for the next 20 years, and for 20 years while you're locked up, give you enough food to eat, but what you going to do? What would you sing in your cell? What would you think about? I remember watching this movie years ago of this guy, and what he had done was he had went to one baseball game, and when he got locked up and they put him in, the, in a hole, he, he had memorized that baseball, every hit, every player. And he replayed that baseball game in his mind. So-and-so was up to bat. So-and-so was pitching. And, and he could go through that whole thing. And for 20 years or for 10 years, in his mind, that's what kept him from going insane, just remembering. What would you sing? Some of us get bored for five minutes and we don't know what to do. Imagine if it was 20 years, 10 years, and God said, what are you going to say? These people are in exile sometimes 70 years at a time. What are you going to hold on to? When you bump into each other, what are you going to say to each other? It, it's, it's all of these things that you see that makes Israel so unique. It's how they have survived for all of these years. God has built within them His Word. His praise, his, it's what they run to in trouble. That's why even now when, when, when there's trouble against Israel, they, they, they run to God. Proverbs is, what can it do? Go with me to Proverbs 4, 6 through 9. Proverbs 4, 6 through 9. So what can I do, Brother Lot? Here's what it says. Do not forsake her, for she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. That's the, the main thrust of what can it do. What, what can wisdom do in your life? Do what? No, you got to get more, under, you got to get understanding. What can wisdom do? I just read it. Somebody tell me. Go back one verse. Do not forsake her. She will. So wisdom does what? Keeps you alive. If somebody says, hey, man, we're fixing to get in this car and we're going to get in this Corvette and we're going to see what it'll do. Wisdom says, no, man, I'm good. Wisdom will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Think of her like a girl, like a woman. That's what they do here. They, they use her like a, like, a, like a mistress that you can, you can have in your life and you need to put her in your life and you need to listen to her more than that. She's whispering in your ear and you need to be listening to her. Do not forsake her. She will preserve you. Love her. She will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. That's just what the book's about. Therefore, if you know it's going to keep you alive, if you know it's your best bet, get wisdom. And while you're getting wisdom, get... Now, what's understanding then? If you say you understand something, what do you say? You, you, you know what? You know what it is. You know what it means. Okay, so... You can have wisdom. If I told you, hey, we fixed to get in the Trans Am, the Corvette, and we fixed to see what this thing will do, and I said, do you want to get in? You said, why? Anybody ever been in a Corvette, seen what it would do? A couple of us. <laughs> but most of us in here, no, I've never rode in a Corvette. So how do you know? You don't know until you try. 
No, you can. Because wisdom, if you love her and preserve and let her do her work, she will give you understanding so that you know eh, that's not going to head where I want it to head. Oh, come on, try. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, I can tell you the worst that could happen because that's going through my brain right now. I can tell you a lot of the worst that could happen. You don't know if that'll happen. Well, my brain is telling me, yeah, that's a pretty. And then later, when it does, what's the first thing you say to yourself? What was I thinking? That's the problem. You didn't, you weren't, because understanding is the ability to think what wisdom has given you. It's to process it. So he says, while you're getting wisdom, while you're getting all this information, gain the understanding to know, here's why. Here's here's why I don't do that. Even though I've never done it, here's why I'm not going to do it. And so we live in a world now that, that we want understanding, but we don't want wisdom. So what, what does most people in this world do? How do they learn things? Trying it. Yeah, let's try it. And then when it doesn't work, we feel bad and disappointed. And, but he says, listen, if you'll start with wisdom... And wisdom says, don't hang around these kind of people, but they're my friends. Well, okay. Wisdom says, don't go around this, but that's, man, can't have no fun. Okay. You'll get understanding, but you won't have wisdom. Because people will later say, that's an idiot. I don't mean it ugly. You got friends you know like that. They've done so many dumb things, you just look at them like, look, don't go riding in with them. They done wrecked 12 cars. The insurance company won't even cover them no more. And here's the crazy thing. Some of y'all got enough sense to give them some money to go buy another car. Here, take mine. Y'all ain't far apart. <laughs> Y'all coming from the same tree. So wisdom is this book of poetry. It's, it's to show us what can I do? So here, here's what it says. Verse, verse 8. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will, man, people will come along and say, hey, that's a, that's a really smart guy. That's amazing. I can tell y'all all the time that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not bright. I'm, I'm, I'm not very smart. I'm not, I tell you all that all the time. But when you're around people and they talk about Pastor Lot, they're going to say, that's a sharp dude. Now, how can it be when I tell you every day that I'm not smart, and yet people will say, that? how do you do that? Because here's the thing. What promotes you? You can say, you can tell everybody you're dumb. But if you do the right thing every time, Guess what eventually your reputation is going to be? That's a smart dude. But you can tell everybody, no, I'm smart now. I'll tell you, I'm smart. And do dumb things. What is your reputation going to be? Don't listen to that idiot. (laughs) Wisdom has the ability to promote you. She will bring you honor. So my whole life, I can tell y'all, guys, I'm not very smart, and I'm not. I can tell y'all, look, guys, I'm not the sharpest, you know, crayon in, in, in the drawer or whatever. But as long as I keep doing the right thing, wisdom says, I don't care what you say, I'm just going to keep pushing. Because wisdom says, I am required to promote you. I am required to bring you honor. Your kids can walk around your whole... You, ugh. This would be good for somebody. Your kids can say, I got the dumbest parents in the world. I'm telling you, my parents are blooming idiots. They, they just let them say it. You keep, you keep getting feeling like you, feelings get hurt. Like, I can't believe my kids feel that way about me. Just keep doing the right thing. Just, just don't, don't bow and say, I don't want them to think I'm a bad parent. Oh, yes, fine, go on to that party. 
No, no, just, just keep standing your ground. They may hate you for the first 15 years, but I promise you they're going to come in the door one day and they're going to think, you know, Mom, Dad, y'all weren't as dumb as I thought. Could I borrow $20? <laughs> no, and I'm still smart. But you can mow my grass and I'll give you $20 in. So you, you learn in life, exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. Verse 9, she will place on your head an ornament of I love that. And, and I always tell you what grace is. It's the ability to do what you can't do yourself. So what he's saying is, is this. As she is promoting you and as God comes along and says, I'm going to put more grace on you so that you're able to do what most people can't do because I know when you do it, you'll do it right. I'll give you a scenario. Caleb in, in the Bible was 40 years old, 40-something years old, and he went into Canaan and said, guys, we can take this land. Come on, get your pitchforks, get your stuff. Get, let's, let's do this. Come on, we can do this. Everybody bailed on him, but, but the Bible says there was a different spirit in Joshua and Caleb. Forty years later, 40 years later, here's an 80-year-old man. No. 40 years later, here's an 80-year-old man. The Bible says, Caleb told Joshua, he said, let me have my mountain. He said, I'm as strong today as I was 40 years ago when God gave it to me. What happened? Did he not get old? He did. But God said, I'm going to give you grace to do what you couldn't do in your own strength. Because wisdom not only promotes you, but it prepares you for an ornament of grace. A crown of glory will she deliver to You want your kids to tell the stories about you? You want your, your family? You want your... You... Live out wisdom. Live out wisdom. You say, I don't have any. Start reading Proverbs. And do exactly what it says. And there's some tough stuff in there, believe me. It's, it's not all easy. But if you will do it, you have a promise. And this is what, this is what Proverbs teaches. So then there's Ecclesiastes, and this is what's so crazy, because a man who wrote 60% of Proverbs is Solomon. He wrote 60% of the book of Proverbs, which says she will promote you, she will bless you, she will... And he didn't do it. Now he's an older man, got a buku of wives. Got all kind of idols and gods and everything everywhere. He's got monkeys. He's got stuff that most folks have never seen. He's got everything. In fact, he makes it clear there is nothing that has not, I have wanted that I did not get. Anything my heart desired, I have gotten it. Because his problem is he started off with wisdom and traded it in for something else. Go and meet Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is all, is, this is man's all. This is all there is. This is it. He went through all of that to come back to Proverbs and say, let me tell you what the summation is. You better fear God. You better do what's right. Keep His commandments. Because ultimately, that's all life is about. The, the, the main thrust of this is, can I find love? And really, look at the person beside you and, and, and look at them and say, can you find love? Go ahead and ask them again. Just look them in the eyes. Can you find love? The answer 
is no. No. Now that's the hardest part of this whole book. That's, that's, that's the summation of this book. I don't care where you look. I don't care what you buy. I don't care what you marry. I don't care how many kids you have. I don't care what you do. Let me tell you one thing you will never do. You will never find love. You have kids, they're going to leave you. Have a wife, a husband, they're going to die on you. Have stuff, it's going to rot on you. It's going to become more of a burden to keep it than it is to get rid of it. You name it, it'll have a weight. Or it'll wear out. Or it'll get old. Let me tell you something. This is not to be ugly. You cannot find love in this world. And that's the hardest. That's why this book stinks. Of all the books in the Bible, that one stinks. Because it's like in your brain, you're like, if I could find the right woman, wrong. If I could get the right job, wrong. You cannot within yourself find in this world the love that you're looking for. That's why the world sets us up like rats on a wheel. If you, can just, if you just wear the right clothes, you'll get loved. If you just have your hair the right color, you'll get loved. If you just drive the right car, even though you can't afford it, they'll love you. If you, if you finally marry somebody good looking... And they just run you and run you and run you to one day you're sitting at your house or an old folks home or and somebody's planning on selling all your stuff because they don't even like it it's been out of date for 20 years and you 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 hawked everything to get it and they're like that's the ugliest piece of furniture oh no that's that's beautiful that's, you know how much that stuff was back in 1972 Am I being ugly enough? Put this for your thing. You can't find love. All is empty nothings. How do you know, brother? I mean, what do you, how do you know that? Because naked you came in this world, and you're going out naked. You know how much you came in with? You know how much you're going out with? You ain't taking none of it with you. And the more you think you are, the more I love Ecclesiastes. I love how Solomon talks about it. He said, he said I, I built all this, did all this, and I'm going to turn over and give it to an idiot. <laughs> I, love, I love Solomon. It's just like, it's, can you imagine your children? You've worked your whole life. you got your tractors. you got your stuff. And, it, and you got this one dumb kid that's in the house like, I'll drive that tractor, Dad. Don't you touch that tractor. And the whole time you're thinking, God, don't let me die of a heart attack. Please don't let me die. Because the day I die, this guy right here in three hours will have it all hawked. That's Solomon. He's like, I spent my life saving it up for somebody that's not going to care. So, so what are you trying to say, Brother Light? If I mean, that's, that's depressing that Ecclesiastes says, can I find love? And you say, no, but we have the song of Solomon. See, if you get too big on yourself, you read Ecclesiastes. And if you get too low on yourself, you turn to the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon says, am I loved? Look at the person beside you and say, am I loved? Am, am I loved? Does anybody love me? Does anybody love me? The answer to this you can put down is, yes, you're loved. You are. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it, not because you can buy it, not because for God so loved the world. That's the story of the Song of Solomon, or Solomon writes about these two Shunammite women who is, who is just a poor girl who is part of the 
sheep herders. And this king, he dresses up and acts like he's poor. And he goes and finds love. And he falls in love. And she's like, don't look at me. My, my skin is dark from being out in the sun. He said, oh, baby, you look beautiful. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm. And he goes through this extravagant, baby, you, you, I'm telling you now, you, <laughs> yeah, I, I can describe you, and he does. He goes into description. He said, oh, don't call yourself ugly. I'm telling you what I see. And the end is him rushing her off to the palace and taking her, my beloved. And so Israel has these songs these poems, to encourage them about a God that many times they don't even understand because we're in exile or we're in bondage. Or... And it's amazing how in our humanity we're built to, even though we're going through things, we, we remind her of a song or we're reminded of, of a story. Isn't it amazing? You can crush us down and then all of a sudden it's like, well, it reminds me of a story. That's because God built you that way. And He didn't just build Israel this way. He also gave them their stories. He gave them their songs. He gave them their books, their hymns. Their... So let's talk about this. As you flip your page, we'll finish up and talk about this, this remnant kingdom. Israel has already gone into bondage. Israel has these books, songs that we said some are still being written, some are older. They're all part of their culture. They have been in bondage for 70 years. Next week we will talk about the prophets that intermingle in all of these years. From all the way to when the kings were to the final prophets that spoke 400 years before Jesus came. But intermingled in this is, is this remnant kingdom. There, there, there is no king. There is no... And 70 years after the bondage of Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar to the Persians to, to all of the people that have kept them in bondage, finally a small group of them, half of them literally get to go back home. Half of them who have fought to keep their identity, have fought to, to, to remain, who have, who have kept themselves as pure, and, and, and to, because their, their heritage, who they are, is all they got. And a man by the name of Zerubbabel, in 536 B.C., 536 B.C. on your paper, came back to start rebuilding a temple. In the book of Ezra, this is described in the first half before Ezra ever goes. And so it's, it's describing Zerubbabel and other, other prophets will talk of, of Zerubbabel who came back and built the, the, the second after Solomon's temple has been utterly destroyed. Zerubbabel builds back a temple. And you can imagine when it describes Solomon's temple and, and all of this and, and Zerubbabel builds a temple. The Bible says that some cheered, some praised, but the older people cried because they remembered Solomon's temple and said, man, it's nothing like that. Zerubbabel had built it for a short time and didn't even complete it all the way because in 525 when you read on your next line, Esther, that's the story of Esther. Anybody remember the story of Esther? The one that won the beauty pageant. So Esther is in 525. Ten years after Zerubbabel goes and starts building the temple, there's the story of Esther. And what, and what has happened is, is that the king has shut down the building project. They stopped it because the Israel people, they were, they were real hard to control. Remember now, they still got this thing in their mind. We're going to be a nation again. We're going to be a nation again. And so, so they were very hard. And, and, and he said, forget it. We're shutting it down. 
Well, now we have the story of Esther, who you can see now the setting is perfect because, hey, we need to wipe out these Jewish people. We need to, but God has placed one lady as the queen. Isn't it amazing? The one position that they would need to be in to preserve their lives. Because here was the decree. The king had through through Haman had created this decree that said on this specific day it was legal to kill Jews that day. So on that day you could take their land, you could go kill them, you could you could stab them, you could kill their children, you could kill you could do whatever. So it was just like, hey, come Christmas Day, man, we are fixing to, we we are fixing to go get that house, and we're fixing to kill these folks and go get that house. That sounds crazy, but that's what it was. It was a day that they were allowed to kill as many Jews and all the Jews they wanted in one day. Of course, the queen, Esther, steps in after a three-day fast, goes before the king, and after a couple dinners, she finally looks at him and says, why would you want me killed? And the king is like, whoa, Esther. I'm not, I'm not killing you. She said, but you are. Because of Haman's decree, I'm a Jew. That means come Christmas morning, somebody's going to come up in this palace and they're going to kill me and take what I got. And you can imagine Haman is sitting there and the king sitting there. That, Haman is not the person you want to be at that moment. He looks like, you the one going to get my wife killed? And so the Bible speaks how the very gallows that Haman was going to hang, the person he hated, he hung from. And even though the Jews, anytime one of the kings made a decree, it was part of their culture, they could not cancel it. So the only thing that he could do was, he said, Esther, here's what I promise you. I will make an, another decree that goes on top of it that the Jews can defend themselves. Well, taking somebody's house don't sound so much fun if they're going to stab you too. And so nothing happened because Esther was willing. So in 525 B.C., this takes place. In 515, the temple is finished. Through Esther, through, through all the relationships, the, the building project begins again. They get the building built. And it's 57 years then, 57 years, in 458 B.C. You can write that. Ezra arrives in 458 B.C. Now, Esther's story is to tell people what courage can do. Ezra's story is to tell people we must not forget our worship. And this is one of the, the oddest stories to me. There are certain parts of the Bible that it really challenges me. And here's what happens. Ezra arrives, and the men that had gone with Zerubbabel, things had, had already kind of fallen apart, and things were not doing good. And the men had already started marrying women from other countries and bringing them in. And they were having children. Ezra shows up, and Ezra tells them, you cannot do this. And one of the most unique moments in Israel's history, to tell you just how, when we talk about how did they survive, there's no Hittites anymore, there's no Philistines anymore, there's no Jebusites, there's no, this is one of those marquee moments that you realize these are a unique people. Ezra says, you must do two things. You must confess before the Lord what you've done. And then you must send the women and your children away. You cannot have them. And in that church service, the men confessed to God, God, we have done wrong. We should have never married into those countries. We should have never. And we are 
sending these women and sending our children away. That sounds horrible. But understand, they are waiting for a Messiah. If I told you Jesus is coming, how would it affect your life? Would you still keep doing what you're doing if you really knew Jesus was coming? If I, if I could preach good as Ezra, and you said, I confess, I am not getting ready for Jesus. I am not. Li- I am through with this. What would it be? Who are you hanging with? Who are you sleeping with? Who are you doing this with? Who are you? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And I know we make fun of Israel and we talk about how they killed Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something. They were a unique group of people. Don't ever underestimate how unique these people were. God did not pick a bunch of losers. Ezra cleanses the temple. Ezra reestablishes worship. Then in 445... B.C., a man by the name of Nehemiah shows up. Anybody heard of that book? In 445, Nehemiah shows up on his first trip there. He leads the people to build. He has a unique ability to... On his first visit, they rebuild the wall. He will go back to the king where he's a cupbearer, and in a short time he will come back and spend the remainder of his life as the governor of Israel. Let me give you real quick, and you can write these at the bottom, five things that it requires to be a leader. Some of you in this room need to lead yourself. Some of you need to lead your family. Some of you need to lead friends. But Nehemiah is a book that teaches how to lead people to build. Number one, you must always encourage people to use their gifts. doesn't matter if you're building a church or building a family or building anything. Let me tell you what will slow it down is when you tell everybody to sit and watch you. You'll stop progress. Now, they may not do it like you. They may not do it as good as you. But your kids can take the garbage out. They can can wipe down the countertops. They can use their gifts to help you build something. First thing you'll ever learn in a family is we work together, we build things together, we accomplish together. And if you didn't teach your children that, then you failed them. Because now they've got to learn how to build. First thing a leader does is encourage people to use their gifts. Number two, a leader always helps people learn to work together. In other words, a leader is out front, working, showing people how to work together. Number three, A leader is able to work out God's plan. And when I say that, understand, to work out God's plan. Because let me tell you something, what you got in your mind many times doesn't come out exactly the way you think it is. So you have to work out salvation with fear and trembling. You have to work out your walk with God. Some of you in this room, you you make a mistake, you quit. You make a mistake, you quit. Let me tell you something, you're going to have to learn to work out the things in your life. To be, a, to be a person who can lead. You're going to have to be able to encourage people. You're going to have to work with help people. And you're going to have to be able to work with people. Number four, you're going to have to serve better than everybody else on the team. Well, I thought I was the leader. Jesus modeled it, a servant leadership. The greatest among you will be your servant. 
Want to be the greatest in your family? Be the hardest worker in your family. Number five, be a friend to the weak. Every room you ever walk in, always look for the weakest. Every room you ever walk in, look for the one that feels like they're out of place. I train my staff all the time. Don't let me catch you sitting together. You walk into a room, you better find the person that needs a hug. person that needs a compliment. If it's you, then walk in a room and hope somebody hugs you. But if it's not, then you got a job. Find the weak. You're only as strong as your weakest person. Your family's only as strong as your weak. And, 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 and if you've done family long enough like I have and others in this room, you'll realize one week you get one strong and another next week the next one goes down. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pump them up. And then the next one, you, it's like the chain keeps changing on you. And, and it's like I just get that one going. Like I hate sometimes when Elise says, I just got a text. I'm like, please don't tell me you just got a text. Please don't tell me you, I'm fixing to go to bed. Always be a friend to the weak one. Your last part there, I've told you that in the Old Testament, everything is built from a king to a prophet to a priest. Let me show it to you in what I've taught you tonight, and I'll get you out of here. Worship equals the temple, equals God, equals your king. They had to go all through this whole circle to finally come back to the conclusion that God is our king. They had to go through all the kings, the trouble, to finally come to the conclusion that God is our king. Number two, the law equals Ezra equals priests and prophets. Ezra was a priest and a prophet. He reestablished worship. He reestablished honoring God. God is our king, and we are to honor him. Now, I told you it takes three things to build a nation, right? It takes... People and money and law and, and who to worship. Got to got to have laws who we worship, who we serve, and who we. The wall that Nehemiah built equals the wealth and brings back the people. Equals the people. So inside this remnant, this is what we move into in the New Testament. So when we come into the time of Jesus, this is what we have. God is their king. They have no priests, hardly, or prophets. And all they have is people. They're just a remnant of what they once were. And they're holding on for a Messiah. The problem is Jesus doesn't fit the bill. What they're looking for is David. They're looking for Solomon. They're looking for a military, somebody who will build the kingdom of Israel back. Even when Jesus is preaching, what does his disciples ask him? When are you going to restore Jerusalem? When will the end be? So, Brother Lot, what do we pull from this part. If I told you tomorrow something bad was going to happen, what songs do you know? What scriptures have you got memorized? Because here's the key. Bad days will happen. And when they do, you're going to fall back on what you are. And if you don't like what you are, 
then change it. Because I can't change that bad times aren't coming. I can only help you change what you are. I'll say it in a story and I'll be done. Me and Elise. Only thing I ever cared about when I was growing up, and I've told this story before, some of you have never heard it. So, Only thing I ever cared about when I was growing up was a pond. I grew up in parsonages all my life. Let me tell you one thing about parsonages is beside churches. They don't dig ponds around them for the pastor's kids to have fun. Somehow that just escapes them, and they decide, graveyards, we have a lot of graveyards next to our house. We played hide-and-seek in a lot of graveyards. No ponds. No ponds. So as I was growing up, the one thing I want when I get older is a pond. I want a pond. We got married. We bought a little place out in the country. We were still driving back and forth for the first two years here. And I would drive there because I was... The job I did allowed me to go by there, and I'd mow the grass, and man, here's our place. And we'd drive back down, I thought, oh, yeah. And I had the pond stocked with catfish. I could take that catfish food and throw it out there, and it just looked like a black cloud would come up. And I used to think, oh. And I'd get in my car and drive back, and it's like, oh, yeah, life is good. And I had to, I had to do this ditch one time. I had to, had to go get a little digger, a trencher, and I had to cut a water line, and I thought, Okay, I'm going to come back through there and I'm going to get me a little trencher, have my little trailer. And, and man, I was cruising back to my house right there in Caledonia and I started rounding the curve. And, I was, and all of a sudden, as I pulled up around the curve, all down the side of the road is red dirt. Just red dirt. And I'm like, what in the world? I got around the curve and as I was getting around the curve to turn in my driveway, I found out where the red dirt came from. We had got like five inches of rain real fast. And my driveway was right across my big levee, my pipe. You know, I had my pipe through there. And that pipe couldn't handle that. It took the pipe a quarter mile or whatever down the road, across the road. All my dirt from my levee was strode in amongst the trees for about a good three or 400 yards. And I sat there and with that trencher in the back of that trailer. Couldn't drive up the driveway. I'd have one. And I'm thinking, man, I got out of the truck. No fish, no pond, no water. I went up to the house. I sat on the porch, looked at it. Big tears coming down my face. Some things just break you, man. And I was 27 years old, 28 years old, and I mean, the only thing I ever wanted in my life was a pond. I ended up with a red dirt pile. And I sat there, and all of a sudden, through the tears, this is what came out. I heard an old, old story about a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me victory. I don't know where that came from. I really don't. I didn't have a hymn book in my hand. I didn't have, but I guess all those songs my mom and dad had sung and all that stuff that I grew up hearing. And when I hit bottom, boom. It's the only thing that came out. See, what the enemy counts on is that he's going to put enough junk in you that when bottom comes, and it will, that what's going to come out of you is anger or rage or, in our modern time, racism or whatever else 
gets thrown at you, like this is what's wrong, this is people hate you, and this, whatever they can put in you other than God. Life's not fair. I'm cursed. I'm just telling you, there will come rainy days. Listen to me very carefully in this room. There will be rainy days. If you listen to anything I say tonight, please listen to this. Go get some songs in you. Go get some scripture in you. Because when you hit bottom, whatever's in you will come out. God built this group of people so that when they hit bottom, and he, hit, he drove them to the bottom a bunch of times, he knew that every time he drove them to the bottom, what they would do was cry back out for him. And that sounds bad, but it's not. There's sometimes God, like Job, allows me to go bottom again just so he can hear me cry out again. And sometimes in your life, he's going to strip some stuff away. And you're going to think, well, God don't love me. No, he loves you too much. Because he wants you to run to him again. And if you had wisdom, you would do it sooner than later. And that's the moral of the story. Will you bow your heads? Father, thank you for our teaching tonight. God, there's so much in your books, so many in these 66 books that just teach us life. God, tonight, I hope that I hope that these people get what I'm trying to say. I hope they do. I'm not trying to scare them or life is life. But what we have in us is what will preserve us, it's what will carry us through, it's what will allow us to sing when we don't even feel like singing. And God, I pray that inside your people tonight are songs of hope, are scriptures of hope, that they realize I'm blessed, even though some days I can't see it, I'm blessed, that God more are for me than those that are against me. And I praise you for that, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hey, guys, go give that old devil fits.